So welcome again to another Tea and Theology. Now I'm recording this one in the evening. I normally record them in the afternoon, but it's been a busy week. So it's evening time, um, which has a bit of difference for the tea that I'm drinking, for I'm drinking decaf. So we will see if decaf tea has any difference in how tea and theology works. And I'm also spilling the tea all over myself. I'm delighted that you're here. You're in my study. And we are going through, I think this is the sixth of our Tea and Theology series. The idea of it's very simple. We just take a little bit of time and we explore some of the big theological issues that are relevant to us. Normally it's about 30, 40 minutes. And some people like to start at the start and work their way through. If you like to stop and start and stop and start, um, you just do whatever works for you. So in our series today, we will be looking at the theology of atonement. But I'm going to go off schedule a little bit today because I'm conscious, as I think we all are, of the murder of George Floyd and of the protests that are going on across the globe for racial justice and equality. And for us, this has brought up a lot of questions about, about racism in our society and, and to say nothing about that this week or today seems implicit in the silence that's allowed racism to persist. So what I want to do, quite simply, is, is to look at where, where we are maybe in regards to racial justice and what questions that brings up for the church. Maybe what things we and what things the church are doing and should be doing. But since this is a theology vlog, I want to position the conversation very much within scripture. And I want to look at it within the biblical tradition. And this one's a bit different for us than our usual topics that we look at in tea and theology because this one's very personal for a lot of people and I recognise that there's there's a lot of rawness in the world right now and maybe that there's rawness for us as we enter into this type of conversation or this type of topic. So we enter it with grace but I also hope we enter it with the courage to be honest as we seek to make visible things that are too often invisible. And again, just by way of introduction, it's possibly useful to, to remind ourselves that this is not a black issue, but it's an issue for all of us. You know, I'm mindful of those words in scripture about the body of Christ, and we find them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which talks about the body having many parts, but, but the ending is the important bit, which says, if one member of the body suffers, then all suffer together with it. So as is normal in our format, um, grab yourself whatever you like to drink and grab yourself a, a Bible and um, let's think about this topic together. So where are we with this today? Or let, let's take stock of the sort of lay of the land at the moment. A few years ago, we lived in Seattle and we, we worshipped in St. Mark's Cathedral. Now, St. Mark's was a, a beautiful big cathedral church in an area called Capitol Hill. And for those who've been paying attention to the news, that part of Seattle has been very much in the crossfire of some of the most um, volatile flashpoints in the States recently. And um, flashpoint between protesters and police. But in, in St. Mark's Cathedral, and St. Mark's did wonderful work in this area of racial justice and, and equality and should be, should be affirmed and encouraged for the work that they did. But in one of their halls or in a small little house that they had that functioned as their hall, there was a room which had a board on one wall and the board was very clearly covering something. And I remember inquiring as to what the board was and why it was there and I was told that underneath the board there was a, a religious oil painting that had some historic value an oil painting from the Easter year but the church had made the decision that it needed to be covered up and I was told in that particular picture and I can't quite remember exactly what the scene was I want to say it was a last supper scene but I could be wrong but in that particular picture um, everyone was white except Judas, who was black. And at the time we heard that, we were shocked by that. It just seemed crazy that that would be 
that would be acceptable or acceptable at, at one stage. But then actually I began to look at other examples of religious art. And it's not unknown that that would be the case. And it's often situated in, in art, but also in other forms of media that, that the villainous characters were black and the good guys were white. Of course, what does that, what does that say about us? What does that say about our own, about our values and how we see the world? I think still when Jesus is depicted in art or the classic one he would be in children's Bibles that are often illustrated, you know, what colour is his skin? Well, he's usually white. He's usually as, as white as they come. But of course, Jesus was a man born in the Middle East. And it's been observed now many, many times that his skin would have been dark. And still when we do confirmation class and we talk about the historical Jesus and what Jesus would have been like, I still find young people shocked to hear the, the very idea that Jesus had dark skin, they often find quite surprising. And I think for me that that's a reminder that we view our faith, very much view the lens of race. And that's just like how we view the rest of the world. So how do we define it? How do we define racism? Well, we can be very technical with this one and say dictionary definition of racism is that racism is prejudice, discrimination or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that their own race is superior. And it's been observed recently that whilst that definition is, is technical and fine, it's, it's also limited and perhaps it, it misses the fact that when we speak about racism, we're not just speaking about prejudice but we talk about prejudice plus power that those two things marry together when it comes to racism and of course racism is experienced often in overt forms and that's what we saw with the incident which started the whole um, protest in in the states but it's also a bit like sin at the door of Cain you know racism is also something that lurks um, when we talk about this, we, we sometimes struggle to find, to find language and, and we use language very interchangeably, you know, and the language that we use sometimes has a slightly different emphasis or it reveals something about our own perspective in regards to this question. Are we talking about prejudice and discrimination? Are we interested in um, structural racism? Are we using the, the language of white privilege? Is this about um, justice or is this about equality? And all of those things are interesting and good, but they often convey something about where we stand in regards to that. Is how we use those words can, can differ significantly according to our own racial story. And, and it's been noted recently and very well sort of sociologically documented that, that often People who are black and people who are white often talk past each other in fundamental ways when addressing racism. And even when we are well-meaning, we often cut across one another in terms of how we perceive this. And of course, I'm talking generally here. Not only do we see racial inequality differently, but we almost have fundamental different understandings of what racism means itself. So we noted that, that white people, maybe particularly mindful here of white Christians, we tend to see racism as, as particularly sinful acts of individual racists behaving badly towards individual people of colour. So that's what I sometimes call the bad apple philosophy. Um, racism is just that there are some people out there who are racist and they behave very badly. That's a bad thing. We need to get rid of the bad apples and once we get rid of the bad apples, everything will be fine. In contrast, it's noted that people of colour often see racism as having not only that individual dimension, but, but a structural dimension as well. And without doubt, the slurs and the personal indignities people of colour have to endure should be, called, should be called racism and should be called out. But racism extends beyond the personal. 
people of colour often see institutions discriminating against them systematically and quite independently of the racial sensitivities or, or lack of sensitivities of those people who work in those systems. Does that make sense? So we can talk about racism as an individual thing or we can look much more structurally at racism. So where are we in regards to the, the churches today? Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of York issued um, a statement recently concerning the events in the US and um, the events that have spread over across the world. And maybe their statement's a good place to start. So I'm, I'm actually going to um, read it out word for word. They said this, they said, recent events in the US have once again drawn public attention to the ongoing evil of white supremacy. Systematic racism continues to cause incalculable harm across the world. Our hearts weep for the suffering caused for those who have lost their lives and those who have experienced persecution and those who live in fear. God's justice and love for all creation demand that this evil is properly confronted and tackled. Let us be clear. Racism is an affront to God. It is born out of ignorance and it must be eradicated. We all bear the responsibility and we all must play our part to eliminate the scourge on humanity. Now, it's worth going on to social media or doing a Google and um, listening to the Archbishop speak because he, he put a little piece um, on, I want to say YouTube, but it may have been Facebook, um, a, a social media statement um, condemning and talking a little bit about the church's response to racism. We had a statement also from Pope Francis who simply advised that we cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. But we Christians, we believe in the equality of all people and we value the richness that comes with racial and ethnic diversity, at least we say we do. But what we recognise theologically, and we're going to work this out as we go through today, is that racism is a sin. And as such, we are obliged to and we must oppose it in all its forms. A few weeks back, we looked at the book of Genesis and we talked about this idea of the fall that we find in Genesis 3. Well, we talked about loss. We talked about this idea of being, being made in God's image. But we also talked about the fall and we, we, we thought about how our own sense of ego and our own sense of selfishness estranges us from God, estranges us from one another and estranges us from the very earth upon which we walk and actually from our own inner self also. And we can see how that plays out through the whole story of Genesis. You know, where jealousy turns brother against brother and I quickly fratricide descends into chaos and tribal violence and in the desire for control and in the desire for domination seen so vividly portrayed throughout that book we see the psychological and spiritual roots of racism and it's something that we must oppose in all its forms. So let's dig a little bit into what scripture has to say about racism. So what does scripture have to say to all of this? Well, let's begin with the difficult stuff. And what I mean by that is let's begin with the ways in which scripture has been used to justify racism. Because it's there. And there are passages that are hard and we, uh, as a church, need to put our hand up and recognise the ways in which our sacred text has been used to, to validate or to give space to, to ideologies that are inherently racist. We are mindful of those people who were owners of slave and slave traders who held a Bible in one hand and a whip in the other. 
we need to examine our text to find where that sort of justification and rationale came from. And one of the first texts that was used and has frequently been used historically to justify racism is from Genesis and it's Genesis chapter 9. And it's, it's the story of Noah. And there's Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. Now, the story is that the floods have subsided and Noah and his family are on land. And in the rather strange story, Noah has a skinful and he is so drunk that he um, lies naked on the ground and we assume he passes out. And it says that Ham goes into the tent. Ham sees him naked. Um, and the ham leaves and tells his brothers and his brothers come in but his brothers don't look at him naked but they cover up their father and their father wakes up and says in verse 25 um, Noah said cursed be Canaan now Canaan was the son of Ham so cursed be Canaan lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers he also said blessed by the Lord my God be Shem and let Canaan be his slave. May God make space for Japheth and let him live in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his slave. Now for centuries this, this passage which is referred to as the curse of Ham has been used to rationalise the oppression of black people and the oppression of black people as slaves. And the message has sadly been preached from many pulpits countless times historically. And it's been used to justify centuries of black subjugation at the hands of whites who after all were only seeking to ensure God's will in the curse of Ham was done. Now it doesn't take someone to be a, an expert in biblical exegesis to ask questions about this interpretation. Firstly there is nothing in the text whatsoever that can be read racially. I mean Shem, Ham and Japheth are, are brothers. They're all the son of Noah. So Ham is of no different race to his two brothers. Now there is this reference to Cana, but, but even then the curse is specifically related to Cana. And Cana were subsequently invaded and conquered by the Israelites. So it's difficult to see any, any rational justification for this text being used other than people using scripture to justify their own aims. There are concerns, however, I think, when we start to look at some of the some of the language in scripture around slavery in general. And, and there's no doubt that early slave traders and owners um, used religious texts, particularly perhaps some of the texts from Paul's writing, to say that slavery was fine. Paul has this line in the book of Ephesians where he says, Slaves, be obedient to your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. And what that might imply if we read it in such a way was that slavery was acceptable, and even more so than that, that slaves should know their place. Now, this is a difficult passage. And some things that we may observe is that slavery, as we understand it today, was a very different creature from slavery in the biblical world. And it still makes me uncomfortable as a text. But there certainly was no identification between racial oppression and slavery in the biblical world. Slaves were sometimes treated badly, often treated badly. But slaves were not seen as subhuman. Slaves were simply the were simply a conquered people. The conquered people became the slaves of the people who conquered them. Now, I think today across the church we assert with confidence that slavery is a sin. But what does the Bible have to say to racism? And I think we begin right in the story of Genesis, just a few chapters before that um, chapter about Shem, Ham and Japheth. Because in Genesis we have this story of creation and it's the story of Adam and Eve. And it may be just that, it may be a story, but it asserts two things that are particularly important as we have a theology, or as we evolve a theology of race. And that is first that we all have a common ancestry. There is no polygenesis 
within Christian thought. We all have a common ancestry. And the second thing is this, that we are all made in the image of God. So let's jump into the New Testament here. More than any gospel writer, I think Luke, Luke consistently focuses on, on issues of justice and inclusion. And for people like myself who have an, an affection for justice ministries, Luke tends to be the gospel that we always turn to. Because for Luke, God's, God's people are inclusive of all who profess the Lordship of Christ, regardless of their gender or their social economic standing or their physical appearance or their ethnicity or racial identity. And this, this radical vision of, of God is, is built in this idea of covenant. That this vision, the covenant in which God promised that through Abraham and through Abraham's descendants, all families of the earth would be blessed. And this, what we call the, Abra, the Abrahamic covenant, provided for Luke this, this scriptural warrant for for the Gentile mission or, or the mission to all the ends of the earth. And it provided this warrant for a, a, a radical inclusive covenant community. And we see it perhaps in, um, in the Namdomitis, which is something that we Anglicans tend to know quite well. And that's the Namdomitis is, is rooted in scripture and we see it in the gospel um, according to Luke and it's spoken by Simeon and it has echoes of Isaiah and, and it says master now that you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel and there is this idea in Luke's gospel that Jesus is God's salvation for all people, regardless of ethnicity and regardless of race. And perhaps we see one of the most, the most cogent expressions of this in the book of Acts, which incidentally is always, is, is always assumed to be written by Luke too. And maybe you'll follow me with this one. It's in Acts chapter 8. Again, I gave you a few moments to find it. It's in Acts chapter 8, and we're going to begin at verse 26. Acts chapter 8 and we begin at verse 26. And I'm going to read it slowly and we'll go through it almost, not quite line by line, but we'll go through it at least bit by bit. All right, you'll find it. Verse 26. Now, Philip, um, here we go. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up, and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza for this this is a wilderness road and firstly the thing we want to note here is that that God is doing something it's not that Philip went there on his own will but it's that God explicitly guided him into an experience so when something like that happens in scripture it's kind of meant to be there for us to go okay something significant there's a there's a game changer about to happen here Let's keep going. Um, so he got up and he went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come up to Jerusalem to worship and he was returning home, seated in his chariot and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now Luke's brief description of this man is more than enough for his first century audience to vividly imagine his character. Firstly, he was from a country that was widely believed, according to authorities like Homer and Herodias and other historians of the day, to lie at the southernmost limits of the earth. So for people of Israel, the, the idea of the Ethiopians was really as other as it could feasibly get. So, so thus, in sharing the gospel with this man, which is what subsequently happens, Philip, Philip confirms Jesus' calling to his followers to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. 
and early readers would understand that this man was ostracized for, for several reasons. First, his skin color was dark. Now we have noticed that people in the Middle East would have had dark skin, but not as dark as the Ethiopians. So he was clearly distinctive and racially different. Furthermore, he was a, he was a eunuch and that would have prevented him from entering into the assembly of the Lord. So he would have been allowed to worship only in the outer chambers of the temple. So let's read on and see what happens. Verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was like this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, starting with the scriptures, and he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? I'm going to stop there because we know what happened. Philip goes out and baptizes him. And it says in verse 29, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. Now shocking as it would have been to early listeners, the Ethiopian eunuch became the first Gentile received to be received into the body of Christ. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch sit side by side and they open scripture together and then the water by the side of the road becomes becomes the, the vehicle through which the youth through which the eunuch becomes part of the body of Christ. There's a radical route here. We may note how quickly the church moved to peel apart. But actually baptism, which has become at times somewhat mundane for us, has become at times just rather ritualistic. It's become at times a means to get a child into a school or keep a grandmother happy. But baptism has always been quite a, a radical feature of the church. Baptism has this idea that, that through it, through the waters of baptism, all identities are transcended. There's this verse in Galatians that's reasonably well quoted. And I think actually I might find it and quote it for you today. And it's from Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. If you want to follow that, just to make sure I'm not making things up, you can. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. It goes like this. All right. As many of you, as were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Through the water of baptism, all our identities become transcended and we receive a new identity in Christ. The theologian John Hard Yoder puts it like this. The reason those distinctions are gone, he said, the distinctions in Galatians, is through the inclusiveness of the cross. Because Christ died for all, that all might live through him, there can be no more discrimination. Yoder refers to being born into a new humanity that 
transforms all distinctions. Our church, sadly, is too often baptized us into radical divisions. Perhaps instead of understanding how our authentic baptism unites us above and beyond our racial identities and challenges us to be one. So what can we do? What can people of faith do in response to this? Well, I think there are a number of layers in terms of how we may choose to look at this. In other words, there are a few layers in regards to how deep we may go in, in terms of addressing this issue of racism in ourselves and in the church. And I think each of those has, each of these layers has virtue in its own right. But I think as we go further down, we see that they ask more of us. It's a little bit like, you know, peeling that onion. You know, there's the outer layer we see. But, you know, what, what else is there? What is, is deeper? So the outer layer is this. And it's quite simply to affirm that prejudice is bad. Which actually, in some ways, is a bit of a no-brainer, I suppose. There are very few people out there who will oppose that. Very few, you will turn around and say, I'm sorry, but I disagree. I think prejudice is a good thing. Because if they were to say that, they're very quickly labelled a racist. And therefore, what we can very easily say is that race is their problem. It's not our problem, it's their problem. And there are actually some, there's some very good aspects about simply affirming that prejudice is bad. Because we can therefore make legislation or we can enact legislation that protect people from prejudice. But actually, that's just, that's level one. There's a, there's a deeper level to that as well. Which is a little more interesting, because that says not just that prejudice is bad, but that says that we should fight against injustice. And that's more interesting because it actually asks questions of us in terms of how are we going to fight against injustice. So from a church perspective, it may encourage the church to take to take positive action, for example, to increase the inclusion and representation of people of colour across the church. I mentioned St Mark's Cathedral early on. I know when I was there, there was a cohort from that particular diocese who were fast tracking people who were Hispanic through the process for ordination to try and increase the diversity in people who um, wear clerical collars and robes. The second thing we may do is it may then drive us to think about how we address issues around systemic racism in, in policing, in prison reform, in education and in employment. And within that, what we must commit ourselves to doing is to educate ourselves and to work towards dismantling systemic forms of oppression. Because racism in and of itself opposes human life and dignity. But there actually is, I think, a deeper level to this again. And that is, I think, that we need to look within ourselves. We need to ask a couple of questions. One, one question that we ask is this, to what extent am I implicit in the racism of my own society? Because that's a really hard question because if we have an, an individualized view of racism, it's easy to say that racism is the problem of the racists. But if we do look within ourselves, we ask ourselves that tricky question, to what extent am I implicit? In 2018, just a couple of years ago, the Catholic bishops in the US produced a, a document called Open Wide Our Hearts. And it stated that Catholics, and the same could be said of all Christians, must acknowledge their own sinfulness and the way in which they have been complicit in the evil of racism. Because we've been complicit often not only by what we have done, but by what we have failed to do. And we know those words because they're words of our confession. And whether we like it or not, silence has been one of the greatest sins of the church. There was a, a sociological study done in 2014, a large one, and it was on religious identity. And it found that religious people 
were more likely to support racist policies than those who were not religious. And isn't that shocking? As we examine ourselves, what we need to do is take upon ourselves acts of repentance as a good starting point. To acknowledge the way in which we have found within ourselves things that are racist, but also ways in which we have been silent to the racism of others, or we have been silent in not addressing and naming racism when we saw it, but rather we let it pass. And of course, we know theologically repentance means more than just saying sorry. Repentance drives us towards change and towards new patterns. But also, as we look within ourselves, we might also need to stop and think for a little bit about what white privilege looks like. And I know as I say that, that privilege is, is a complex phenomena and privilege plays out differently according to gender and class and all those factors. And I get that. But addressing racism is not just about supporting people who are black. But it's also about confronting our own white racial privilege. And I'm not trying to put white guilt on people because I think white guilt doesn't set anyone free. But I think what we need to do is to be mindful of the ways in which we have benefited from the social norms that have affirmed us more than others. And often we don't even see them. There's this scriptural principle sometimes of pouring ourselves out or emptying ourselves of our own entitlements for the sake of other people. And I think as we as we finish there, there's two things that we can do. One, we can we can redouble our efforts as people to listen. And even when listening is hard and when there's a lot of noise and chaos. We need to listen to minority voices in the church and beyond the church. We need to listen to the voiceless and to those who, keep, who have kept silent and who keep silent after years of oppression. We need to recognise that we are a community of reconciliation and our witness to the world begins with our living that reconciliation within our own walls. So one, we redouble our efforts to listen. But I think two, we need to speak, we need to preach, we need to talk about the sin of racism. And we need to keep before each of us our need to repent and our needs to see ways in which we may be complicit in the sins of the past and of the sins of today. It's hard for us as a church to have these conversations. Sometimes I think we, we think these are things that we really should not be talking about in the church. But we know that's not true. These are exactly things that we need to be talking about in the church. So we take small steps. We recognise that God may be doing something in our world. And we get on board with what the Spirit is doing. All right. Until next week, God bless.